estate measurement and free living secret. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, I'm super excited to present my research from undergrad, and uh, let's just go ahead and jump into it. So identifying sensitive periods of an animal's life cycle is super important information for wildlife conservation and management. And the ability to easily measure the health and nutrition of wild animals is a really valuable tool. Um, one that is still being developed, of course. And I like to think of it kind of like how humans can visit the doctor for a quick assessment of their physical health, we want to know how can we develop tools to do the same for animals in the wild. So let's think for a minute about what happens when an animal eats something. First, they'll enter this digestion phase, eventually followed by some period of fasting, and if they still don't eat again, eventually some deterioration phase. Now, what really goes hand in hand with this idea of feeding is the process of metabolism. And this process really produces a lot of intermediate and end products called metabolites, which can be easily measured in the plasma concentration of animals. Um, today we're going to focus on four key energetic metabolites, um, so let's just go ahead and jump into those. First one's going to be glucose. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this one. It's a high energy, short-term energy source that's highly regulated in the body due to its key roles in the central nervous system and brain. We also have cholesterol. This is more indicative of long-term energy intake. Triglycerides, which are fats used as energy reserves in the body and beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a ketone body produced from the breakdown of fatty acids during fasting. So these metabolites, like I mentioned, are measurable in the blood plasma of animals, and this has been, these trends you can see kind of change over time. Each metabolite displays a distinct pattern as uh, time passes from that last feeding event. So these trends have been really well established in animals in captivity undergoing food restriction um, and in kind of laboratory-like settings. So we have an idea of what these should look like as time passes from that last feeding event. Now, in reality, individuals are actually cycling more between this feeding and fasting phase, not actually spending much time in that deterioration phase, hopefully. Um, and here we have an example of what happens when an individual is feeding relatively frequently. So here we have kind of short feed fast intervals. And you can see that these yellow phases here are relatively short. Um, and this individual will be in kind of better nutritional state. Now, conversely, if you have uh, less frequent feeding events, you see that yellow phase is a lot longer here and indicates longer feed fast intervals. So this is more consistent with individuals showing poor nutritional state. Now, if we look at these two side by side, we can actually see those overall metabolite concentrations look quite different depending on the frequency of feeding events. Um, and though these trends have been fairly well established in individuals in captivity, it does lead me to wonder, can we use these trends to estimate the nutritional state of animals in the wild as well? So using this concept, I set off with two research objectives. And this was to evaluate these metabolite responses to both food availability and breeding stage. Um, the availability of food is a super important concept in wildlife, and breeding period is a very energetically cost energetically costly period of time, um, so it's really important to understand what's going on during those phases. So to address these questions, I headed out to Middleton Island. This is a small island in the Gulf of Alaska where the Institute for Seabird Research and Conservation runs an annual seabird monitoring program. And out here, the star of the show is the black-legged kidduit. This cute little guy is a colonial nester, and hundreds of these birds return to Middleton every summer to uh, essentially raise their young. So, Hundreds of pairs will nest on this tower every season and uh, produce chicks and eggs and all that fun stuff. So using these birds, we kind of set off to address these objectives. Now, another super important aspect of the Middleton study system is this food supplementation experiment. Um, using this experiment, individuals are fed at the nest three times per day uh, through a small feeding port, and this essentially increases their overall food availability, <laughs> shortens those feed fast intervals, and improves their nutritional state. Plus, it's fun and kind of disgusting to watch, but <laughs> we got to hand feed those birds a lot of times throughout the season. Um, and so using this food supplementation experiment, it became very easy to evaluate this metabolite response to food availability. More specifically, I initially hypothesized that metabolites would actually reflect nutritional state in free living seabirds, and we would see some response of food supplementation um, in our fed individuals. So we expected these fed birds to be in better nutritional state with higher levels of glucose and triglycerides and lower levels of cholesterol and ketones, more consistent with those shorter feed fast intervals. Next, we also wanted to look at that breeding stage once again, and 
More specifically, we expect that the nutritional state would vary between the breeding stages naturally, um, and that this would also be adequately reflected in our metabolite levels. For our purposes, we divided the breeding period into three distinct phases here. First one's pre-laying, moving into incubation, and finally chick bearing. Each of these stages has really unique energetic demands, um, and we expect that our metabolite levels to kind of fluctuate according to those energetic demands and differences in resource allocation. So here, during pre-laying to kick us off, we expect to see the best nutritional state just because during this phase, individuals have a little bit more flexibility to allocate resources to their own self-maintenance. Um, while in subsequent stages, energetic demands kind of take a hike, and we expect to see the nutritional state to decline during those phases um, as a result. Now, with all this in mind, we collected samples throughout the entirety of the breeding season, um, and we managed to obtain 29 control and 23 fed samples during pre-lane, seven control and 11 fed samples over incubation, and a whopping total of 34 control and 36 fed individuals during chick bearing. At each and every sample, uh, we collected a small blood sample from the brachial vein in the wing, which was immediately tested with this array of point of care devices. Now, a lot of you may recognize these as human health monitors, and that's exactly what they are. But these ones have actually been validated for use in kitty wakes previously and are super handy in the field. They make blood sampling and metabolite analysis very affordable and accessible. And they're really small, battery powered, and require just super small volumes of blood and deliver pretty much instantaneous results. So very satisfying, no nitty gritty lab work involved. Um, so yeah, we like that. So with all these data in hand, uh, we're gonna go through our results one by one. And I'll warn you, the models look a little bit bulky up here, but we're just gonna go through it. I'll hold you guys' hands and we'll get through it together. So first we're gonna look at glucose. So for every single uh, metabolite, we fitted linear models um, to determine the effect of that supplemental feeding treatment and breeding stage on our overall metabolite concentration. So um, first we can see that up in this box, we have our group significance indicated. And here for glucose, we have very high differences between our fed and control birds with that was fed individuals showing very high levels of glucose compared to our control group. So this is consistent with our initial predictions, kind of indicating that this group is in better nutritional state overall. Now up at the top, we have our um, significance of breeding stages indicated by those bars and asterisks. And you can actually see surprisingly here that those glucose levels are significantly lower in pre lanes and subsequent stages which is directly opposite to what we initially expected. So this was really interesting to see um, and actually seems to be pointing to the fact that pre lane may have individuals in poor nutritional state during this phase. Now for cholesterol, we did not see any difference between our feeding treatment groups, unfortunately, but we did see very strong differences across all three breeding stages here. Um, and again, I wanna point out those super high levels of cholesterol during that pre lane stage. Again, not what we expected at all, but that is consistent with our glucose results in terms of showing individuals in a bit of poor nutritional state. Um, now, cholesterol takes a dive during incubation and then raises a bit during chick rearing, um, but some interesting trends overall. For ketones, we're not really seeing a whole lot in terms of significance here. We do have a small difference between chick rearing and pre lane with higher levels of ketones in that pre lane phase. Um, again, consistent with poor nutritional state during this phase, so there seems to be a pattern here. And finally, triglycerides. We see a significant difference between our two treatment groups with those fed individuals indicating higher levels of triglycerides once again, showing us that that fed group with the supplemental fish provided um, seems to be in better nutritional state. So that's great. It confirms our initial predictions once more. Um, and we don't really see any trends in terms of differences across the breeding period here. So just to take all of that in mind and revisit those initial hypotheses, let's talk about food supplementation for a sec. So here we thought metabolites would reflect the nutritional state of our food living seabirds, and we found that yes, this was true, and we saw fed birds in better nutritional state overall. Now, um, this was observed primarily through higher levels of glucose and triglycerides, which seem to be reliable indicators for us. Um, ketones didn't really tell us a whole lot, and this may be as a result of not enough food discrepancy, or these patterns may be teased out more in feed four years. Um, and same with cholesterol, there's kind of some uh, 
discrepancies in the literature about what people think cholesterol does and what it reflects, and we didn't really see many patterns here, so this would really benefit from additional years of study. Now, in terms of breeding stage, uh, we expected that nutritional state would naturally vary between the stages and would be adequately reflected in our metabolite levels as well. And here we did observe this pattern, but not at all as we initially predicted. In fact, we saw worse nutritional state during that pre-weighing stage with signals of improved nutritional state during incubation and shift varying. So there are quite a few potential explanations for this, but I think the most promising is actually colony attendance. And a previous study by Chamblay et al. in 2022 revealed that uh, kitty wakes, specifically on Middleton, actually spend a high proportion of their time attending the colony during the pre-weighing phase. Um, and this is for a variety of factors. Essentially, they are an agnostic, uh, sorry, they are engaged in a lot of agnostic behaviors during this period. They're trying to get those prime spots on the tower. They're trying to build their nests. They're engaged in courtship behaviors. So they're spending a lot less time feeding out at sea and this is kind of reflected in our nutritional state. Those longer feed fast intervals come across as poor nutritional state during that stage. So this is all great. You may be thinking, Lauren, awesome. Like we already know how to evaluate condition a lot simply like with other metrics. So here we wanted to see how do measures of plasma metabolites actually compare to other common indices of individual condition. So to do this, we turn to the very common metric of size correct and mass. This is used widely in literature to evaluate body condition of animals. And uh, we kind of just wanted to compare this to our uh, use of metabolites. So here we use AIC model selection to investigate the relative contribution of each metric of condition in explaining variations in nutritional status. And what we found was really interesting to me. Um, we saw that our best fitting model actually included size correct and mass and our two most reliable metabolites, glucose and triglycerides. So again, interestingly, we see that the model, including only size corrected mass, um, is very well outweighed by these that incorporate metabolites. So what this is really telling us is that these two metrics of size corrected mass and our good reliable indicators of nutrition, metabolites, um, when combined can provide a really more accurate reflection of individual condition than size corrected mass alone. So when possible, you should really try to incorporate multiple measures of condition. And uh, if I had to say, I would suggest incorporating metabolites in your next study, if you could. Um, it's really interesting in reflecting condition aside from traditional methods. Now, just to wrap up, Essentially, we found that plasma metabolites do adequately reflect nutritional state of kitty wakes in the wild, and in fact, seem to improve measures of condition over traditional methods such as size corrected mass alone. So this could be a really valuable tool for conservation physiology in particular, in which it will enable us to infer population health and even as a proxy environmental food availability. Um, tools like these are rapidly developing and the use of metabolites is becoming more prominent in current literature and they can really help provide um, real-time informative measures of conservation and wild waste management. So they can just help us get a more accurate reflection of what's going on out there and tell us what we should be doing to um, help individuals and populations that are experiencing stress. Now, that was a lot of information and unfortunately there's a lot more. So if you're interested in learning more about using plasma metabolites in conservation physiology. I did recently publish this work and I would be happy to answer any further questions about it as well. I did have to skim over some of my other interesting points today, but it's all there if you want to give it a look. And QR codes here again, but I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who made this project possible, especially the field crew, especially Stella sitting right here, <laughs> and the ISRC for supporting this work. This was a super fun project um, with a lot of great partners and I'm very proud to be a part of it. So uh, thank you all for attending today and